of success stories in which you have reformers in different states across the country who are seriously trying to tackle questions of public service delivery in ways that have had results. Um, and I think to, to assume that, um, th that, that we need a kind of big shot way of, of tackling high level corruption and, and rooting out the, those kind of diseases um, is, is what we should be aiming for, misses the fact that there are already ongoing processes of administrative reform which are, are starting to tackle some of these things. So I suppose I'm slightly more of an optimist, um, but I hope still a realist <laughs> and, not, and not viewing things. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, yeah. Not, I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't do, have all those mm. things, but I'm saying if you want a, a big central thing to do, mm. then reform the political funding. Mm. I mean, I don't know whether it's possible for, for individual states to do it, but to start in that way. Mm. But this is a, you're looking for some sort of big, big, broad you're, view. You're, you're, well, you're my not, big, broad view <coughs> would, would be, and I'm sure I shall get be laughed at for this, but if only um, Kedrival and, and, and Raul Gandhi had somehow got together um, a year or two ago, and if Raul Gandhi had only woken up a year or two ago, because he's now actually saying the, half the right things, if only those two had got together and started to change politics, then I think we would be looking at a, at a new India. We need changes at the centre. We need the old political ways changed and, and doing broad sweep stuff, broad sweep generalisations. Um, and Kedriwal, who's got no experience, and Raoul, who's never bothered to show any, do have, do, do what have. What a great combination. It's a such a, it's, it's, it's such a cheap shot. You get a laugh for poor Raoul Gandhi. I mean, um, three cheers for him. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's new people coming into politics and it's youth demanding change. In the next election, those votes may go into chaos because of Kedriwal att attracting votes and not being able to deliver. Let's see where it goes. But we need new leaders and, and, and new youth coming in to change things. You know, Kedriwal and Rahul Gandhi may yet talk to each other, but after the election. Uh, when, when you well, somebody was trying to persuade somebody was somebody was trying to persuade me here earlier today that in fact they've been talking to each other for about a year and the whole thing is planned. I don't believe that. <laughs> This is your chance to just sort it all out. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, nation yeah, is waiting. I think we'll need a few more literary festival uh, get, get together. But let, let, let me make a point, a point that sta stands back a bit from the immediate rush of uh, election <coughs> season and so on, and, and, and because I'm sure there'll be more of that in the discussion. But and, and here is where I think there is reason to 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 at least feel in principle optimistic, uh, and that's this that you know. All democracies are, when they're working well, are essentially learning mechanisms. They, they're, they're ways of trying to learn from how you, from your mistakes. How do you get better? And in fact, I mean, the U.S. is an extraordinary example of that, where it, it from a whole series, from political uh, crises, from international crises, from economic crises, it's each time it's learned and created a capacity to be more robust in the face of future crises. And in a sense, the, the Indian uh, post-1947 story uh, has, is, is partially that as well. And that's something that needs to, 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 to happen more. And what I would say here is that you know, with the 28 states already in the union and more that are likely to be created in the next years, we have an extraordinary internal laboratory of different experiences. As Louise said, you know, there, there are some that are doing really well. There are some that are not doing really well. And it's not for the obvious reasons why some are doing well and others are not doing well. Like we think great leadership is necessary for a state to do well. Well, that's not always the case. In fact, leaders can come and go and a state can still do well because the bureaucracy works, because the administration works, because hospitals, <coughs> schools and so on work. And a perfect example of that would be Tamil Nadu. You've had yeah. uh, chief ministers coming and going, political parties mm -hmm. coming and going, and yet the, the bureaucracy, the administration has continued to deliver health, education, all of those basic services. So this idea that it's only a good leader that can do it is, I think, a delusion. So the point there is if we study, if we learn from the kinds of different experiences of the Indian states, if we can actually evaluate a bit more what the effects of social policy are, what, what we do at the moment is we just scatter a whole range of different policies and then we never actually look at what their effects are. We, they, they sort of carry on for years and years and years, they become entrenched, even reservations itself. You know, as you, as you know, in the Constitution they were supposed to be only for 10 years and then renewed yeah. thereafter. But no one has, we don't actually have objective studies 
of what their effects have been. It's all based on, here, uh, on anecdotal evidence, essentially. And that's where I think something like the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy, or you know, to feed these into public debate, to feed them into the political parties, into the thinking of the political parties, so they can actually use them to define their, their manifestos, their agendas, present the citizenry with real choices about how to act in relation to these problems, rather than simple generalities about what they're going to do. You know, so, so that's what I would just end, end yeah. my bit on. Yeah. Yeah. One, of the, one of the subplots, or the main plots in, in, in my book, <coughs> is, is, is Jugard and Jugar or Jugard and Chaltahe. Um, I, 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 I wasn't going to mention this, but I'm picking up your, what you've just said. Um, it strikes me that um, a lot of what happens here in, in this country is a fix-it solution yeah. rather than serious policy debate. Mm -hmm. And if you have a society which believes in Jugar, which believes in fix-it, and then Charles Hay, which is everything's going to be all right on the night, you don't get a, a government or a bureaucracy or institutions, a, apart from um, academic, um, who seriously go into, into these subjects and look at them for Absolutely. solutions. Okay, now it's your turn to ask questions. I don't want any solutions from any of you. I want questions. <laughs> Quick, short questions. Now, the gentleman sitting in the middle there, on, on your, on your, on the, over there, behind you, behind you, that one. Ask a nice, short question. Yes, I'll, I'll... Uh, uh, my I'll, question is to John. Uh, do you see a silver lining? <laughs> Has ah. to be golden. <laughs> Yes, of, of course I do, because it's a country with, with enormous potential, <coughs> with great natural resources, with great people, with great culture, with great history, uh, and with a, a, a lot of young people who want it to be different more passionately than earlier generations did, and I've been here on and off for 30 years. Um, certainly the passion for change among the, the young is much stronger now because there's a belief that they can change things. Um, I think before people were just going to accept things as they were, I think the desire for change is, is, is the silver lining. And, and a country with such huge um, capacity in all the ways I've just mentioned must eventually solve this. OK, there's a lady, a young lady there, just right, right there. Yeah. I'll, I'll come to you, Bina, in a minute. Uh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, okay, this is not going to be a short question. No, but no, make it short. Okay, I'll try my best. Make it short. I'll try my best. Um, one of the things that India really is at the crossroads with is freedom of speech and expression. Um, I can feel it as a citizen and... No. Is that the case or not? Why don't you ask that? <laughs> All right. Well, the question is that I can feel a certain kind of fear that is injected into the polity over the last several months. It's the kind of fear that makes editors of mainstream newspapers and magazines self-censor themselves. Uh, it's the kind of fear that sidesteps a certain kind of discussion at okay. even the Jaipur Literature Festival. And maybe it's also the kind of fear that makes someone as eminent as uh, Meghna Desai joke uh, when he has to take a certain name about a political candidate. And my question is that I really want the panelists to address this aspect of a certain dilution of freedom of speech and expression head on. Um, okay. Thank you. I think Thank you. Thank you. No, no, that, 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 that's it. You know, I just used to say, Lord, make that they say jokes all the time. Uh, he's not worried about any freedom of expression. Uh, now, tell me, <laughs> are you afraid of Narendra Modi? <laughs> I have. I haven't uttered his name myself, but I, but I will, and I'm not afraid to. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think maybe what you're what you're getting at there is a is a sense of partiality on the part of many media organisations. Um, that it's as, uh, it's as it's as much a question about objectivity in reporting as it is fear of taking certain positions. Um, I, there's a lot of vigorous debate in. Uh, um, in, in the Indian media, but, but maybe yeah, not always in the directions uh, that, 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 that we might wish. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I mean, I, it's, it's not, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, if you think there's no freedom of expression, just watch the appalling chat shows on television every evening. Um, <laughs> on, on freedom of expression. I'm on most of them. I know you are. Um, <laughs> and then people tell you that you should not deal with Indian politics because you're a politician in London, where you Absolutely. should stay. Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, 
I don't worry about freedom of expression. What I do worry about, I mean, in this context, what I do worry about is corporate ownership of newspapers exactly. and corporate newspaper ownership of newspapers who, who, are, um, who want Narendra Modi elected and who therefore control what appears um, in the newspapers and on television. And I didn't mention Mukesh Ambani. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think that's a really, really important, I totally agree with that. That's a really important one. The only thing I would just add to that is I think, you know, we're, we're, there's also been in, in the many different democratizations that have occurred over the last uh, 65 plus years, 67 years in India, there's also now been a democratization of offense. So everyone now <laughs> right. has the right to be offended. Uh, and, and not only that, but to actually kind of, you know, make public uh, disturbance about that. Yeah. And that has become a kind of way also of checking the space, constraining the space of free expression uh, and, 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 and free speech. And that, in a sense, is going to be a necessary battle that we have to play out. Because at a time of great social change, when certain kind of mor certain ways of doing things, certain <coughs> habitual customs and so on are, are, are going to be questioned and challenged. There's, de there's going to be a kind of contestation between those trying to expand the space of free speech and those who want to keep it under constraint. So I don't see that as somehow uh, 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 an unusual thing. It's part of the process of expanding the realm of freedom in our society. Can I say something else? So one yeah, last hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, no, no, we have, no, then we I have. don't, no, no. Yeah, okay. Uh, we uh, have time for one question now. It's not six o'clock yet, time no, to we, six. Uh, <laughs> Binagarwal. It's, it's, it's not five two yet. It, it, it's not even five two. Binagarwal. She may just give yeah. an answer, okay. not ask um, a question. Since Meghnath, you're going to give me like three seconds. Um, I just want to say that, look, we are also in there as a, as a moral, there's a moral crossroads at which we are. If you look at the professionals of the 70s, RTI came out of huge sacrifices. Aruna Roy, Bankura, I mean, all these people went out. And somehow we've lost that. So I want to bring back the question, what is our idea of a good life? And what are we going to use our natural resources for? Shouldn't we be asking that again? Um, people want change. Are they willing to sacrifice for that? OK. Yes or I no? knew you were going to turn to me yes first. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, uh, one, of the, one of the big debates, of course, which, which has to take place, and it's not taking place as it should, is, 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 the, is the Jaira and Ramesh, um, etc., argument about, about new, new projects and the environment. Yeah. And there's a desperate need in this country. There's been a lot of debate about growth versus freebies, the, 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 the um, current government's allocation of freebies rather than worrying about growth. Equally serious, or maybe more serious, is the debate about growth and the environment and how do you balance the need for infrastructure projects and all the rest with, with, the, with the need for economic growth. You've got to get into the forest, you've got to do some mining, but you've got to do it in the right way and it's a debate which has not taken, taken place so far. I'm terribly tempted to come back to a point which I ought to have made just now and this is probably very tactful. I don't mind newspaper owners providing we know who they are. With the Hindu who was just going, we're on the Hindu platform. With the Hindu who has controversially changed their editor, we knew, we know who the Hindu owners are. We don't know, with a lot of the other newspapers, who the owners are. They're not visible. Okay. Now, uh, I, I'm, I'm told I have no more time, but since I don't know the orders. Uh, shall, we, shall we end the session, please? Okay. My freedom of speech has been curtailed. <laughs> what is yeah, your but, but let me say this. As, as um, uh, Sunil was saying uh, about democratization of uh, offense, the JLF crisis is yet to come. There are two more days before we get an FIR. <laughs> <laughs> with, that, with that good thought in your mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being so patient. Thank this you so much. This will be used. Oh. FIR from Mukesh Ambani.
A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the last session of the day at the Google Mughal Tent. The name of the session is How to Write a Screenplay, and we have Sabrina Dhavan in conversation with William Sutcliffe and Nicholas Shakespeare. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you to begin. Hello, I'm William Sutcliffe, and it's a real pleasure to be here um, and to be sharing the stage with Sabrina Dhavan here and Nicholas Shakespeare. Um, and we're going to discuss screenplays, but before we start, I should start with, I think, a little disclaimer, which is that this session is called How to Write a Screenplay. So I should probably say before we start, it being 6 p.m. now, I don't think anyone come 7 p.m. is going to know how to write a screenplay if they don't know how to write one now. Um, and we're maybe going to talk about the whole how to write a screenplay industry later and then the kind of mystery of the process and how even being in the process it remains very mysterious and frustrating. Um, so I think we're going to start with you, Sabrina. If you could, you're best known for the film Monsoon Wedding. Could you tell us how that came to be written and how it came to be made? <clears throat> how it came to be written is, you know, it's a, in some ways writing, whether you're writing a novel or a screenplay, is a lifetime process of things you take in and then they sort of come out in your writing in some form. Um, like Monsoon Wedding, I came from uh, upper middle class Punjabi family in Delhi. It was a world I knew very well. Um, what was really important to me, and this is even before I became a screenwriter, was that I wanted to write a movie that dealt with sexual abuse within the family because it was something that I knew was rampant from growing up in Delhi. It happened frequently, but we never actually have a conversation about it, at least at the time. There was no public conversation about this, and that was really important to me. So that was sort of the driving incentive to write the movie that in some ways is light and is about a wedding, but that was the driving force. And in terms of how it got produced, I got very lucky. Um, I ran into Meera Nair at my film program at Columbia University. And when I say ran into her, I mean I literally sort of ran into her. We were in, an ele we were in a hallway and I saw her and I wanted to approach her and say hi because I knew her and I knew her work and there were very few female South Asians working in the film business. But I was very shy at that time, no more. Um, and uh, I wavered and then I saw her about to leave and I just ran up behind her and said, hi, ah, my name is Sabrina, I'm Indian. So she <laughs> had just heard about me from um, one of the professors of the film program and she said, oh, you're Sabrina, let's go down and have some chai. We had some chai and she said, what are you working on? I was working on a short film at the time and she asked to read the script. I didn't have a copy so I ran back upstairs and found a copy lying somewhere around, gave it to her. She took it home. I didn't think I would hear back from her, but she called me the next morning at a very respectable 9 a.m., but I was a film student, so I was still asleep. Um, and she said, you know, we should do something together. And I told her about Monsoon Wedding, and she wanted to do a movie that was set in a wedding. And was like, well, that's too bad. And then I went back, and I thought about it. And I thought, well, maybe I can do the sexual abuse within the setting of a wedding somehow. And that happened. And it was a very low-budget film, which I think sometimes is an easier way to get a film produced. Um, and you know, and then it just sort of steamrolled from there. I think I wrote the first draft in December, and we shot in August, which almost never happens. But did then. And so, would you say it was a collaboration with the director from the very start, from the conception of the idea? Well, it's always a collaboration. Film is a deeply collaborative medium. Um, I wrote the first draft on my own. I actually wrote it for a class. I was still a student, and I was supposed to be in a revision class. And like most writers or at least like myself, I procrastinated till the very last minute. Um, and then I had three days before I had to be in this class for which I had to have a full script. So I sort of wrote it very rapidly over three very sleepless nights. And I was young, so I could do sleepless nights then. I can't anymore. Um, and actually, the, the movie, which is an ensemble because it has multiple storylines, I didn't see it like that. I actually saw it as Rhea, the niece's story, for those of you who've seen the movie. But because I was writing so quickly, I'd write a scene, I'd get totally stuck, and I had no idea where the movie was going to go from then. So I'd start writing something else. But just had to get to 90 pages. And the ensemble nature of it emerged. And then I showed it to Mira, and after that, of course, on the revision process, we developed it. Yeah. And in terms of the technical aspect of putting mm -hmm. a screenplay on the page, um, because however many films you've watched, you don't necessarily know how to lay out a screenplay, how mm -hmm. to structure a screenplay. Was the process of actually studying film instrumental in you being able to get that written as a screenplay? That's a really interesting question. I get asked that a lot. Do you need to go to a film program to write a screenplay? Because most people we know, and I, 
I, I'm sure you've all experienced this or you've experienced it yourself when you go to see a movie, you think, Arey, I could have written a better movie than this, ye kya cheez hai. I have this idea. Everybody has an idea, from like a taxi driver to somebody on Wall Street, everybody has an idea for a movie. But actually executing that idea in a way that works requires tremendous skill and craft. I think you can learn that by writing a lot. You can learn it on the job, so to speak, by writing it. For me, the film program really worked well. I don't think I could have understood. I didn't actually come into the film program even thinking I could be a writer. I had never seen, I grew up in the 80s in Delhi. I had never seen a street play. I didn't know what it looked like on the page. Uh, so for me, it was critical to be in a program. I think that really helped me. You know, and Monsoon Wedding was the first feature uh, that I wrote, that fully full feature that got produced, but it wasn't the first thing I'd written. I'd been writing for years before that, sort of learning the craft. Writing so, screenplays before that? At the program. I mean, I didn't write a screenplay till I came to the film program. Mm -hmm. I think people are more sophisticated now. I was an idiot. And did Mira, as a professional in the industry, as opposed to people who were teaching classes and things like that, did she open up a whole new way of writing to you? Did she have some special insight that set her apart? Um, I had learned screenwriting, so what I learned in the screenwriting program was very valuable and that's what got into the movie. What was wonderful about writing with Mirana, for example, uh, I had made this short film and it was very successful, so I got a lot of industry meetings, which were very exciting at the time, and then they'd ask me and I'd go for these meetings, and I was young and so pleased with myself. But I'd go for these meetings and they'd ask me, well, what are you working on now? Like, do you have a feature film that we could produce? And I'd say, well, I want to write this movie about sexual abuse. It takes place in India, in New Delhi, and it's very culturally specific. And no producer in America had any interest in that because it had no commercial viability. It had no American characters. It had no American setting. And then when I started writing it, I wrote it in the way that we talk in India. For example, you know, it's between Hindi and English, and it's sometimes English and sometimes Hindi. It's occasionally Punjabi. And all those things aren't commercially viable. Subtitle films don't do well in North America. And Monsoon Wedding was shot in India, but it's very much an American film. It was produced in America and it's set in India, but um, you know, and it's written like an American film as well. And what I got from Mira, I remember calling her one day in a panic and saying, should I make everything in English? You know, should I make it more commercial? Because I, and she said, write truthfully, be authentic, write it as it would happen. And I did, and that was very liberating um, and very freeing. So she's great with courage. She's great with courage. And in terms of, would it be a cliche to suggest that um, directors are always thinking visually, whereas writers particularly, we'll come onto this with Nick, Nicholas, who's also a writer of prose. If you write prose, it's potentially a less visual medium mm. than film. Did she have a particular sort of visual take on the story that took it in a different way? Well, all the directors I worked on have a visual take on the story. You know, a writer usually only has control till the first draft. After that, it's all collaboration. It, you know, it's with the director, of course, but it's also with the producer. It's also with the actors. It's also with the locations manager. I might imagine a set that's where there's a balcony here and a horse carriage there and something else there, and that doesn't exist. So, you know, actors frequently want input into a screenplay as well. So it is. It is all collaborative to that extent. Um, so mm. she does, th I mean, of course she thinks visually. I mean, her whole thing is design, and sometimes that design has to inform the narrative as well. I remember particularly one scene, I had written it inside a car, and you know, cars aren't very cinematic. And she said she, you know, that it should be on a place like this. And then you re engineer it, and it, you know, that also means rewriting it because you can't simply change the location, it has to fit into that. So, yeah. Mm. Okay, I'll throw this. I want to ask you, but before we move on to you, Nicholas, I should just check that we're all audible. Is the sound okay? Can you hear? Can everybody hear what we're both saying? Okay, what we're all saying. Okay, that's good. So, Nicholas. Nicholas is a very accomplished and acclaimed novelist, but um, your novel, The Dancer Upstairs, was adapted by you for John Malkovich, as he directed it, and the film uh, was made and starred Javier Bardem. Could you explain the story of how, how that film, again, how it came to be written and then made? Um, I had written this novel in 1995 called The Dancer Upstairs, about, set in Peru about a Maoist revolutionary group. And I remember it, I had, was lying on my bed, rather despondent in London, at two in the morning, having just taken my girlfriend to India 
and spending my last penny on her, to whom the novel was dedicated and who was going to leave me anyway. <laughs> and this is awful. The phone rings at two in the morning, and I'm thinking, who on earth rings at two in the morning? And it's my agent in New York to say that while I'd been away, the, the, the book had come out and had got very nice reviews, and it had disappeared. And he had one or two Kitchen of Life comments he wanted to make on it. And I'm thinking, why is he ringing now? And he's, oh, and John Malkovich wants to make a movie of it. And I'm thinking, I really have not got enough humor to to tolerate these jokes of this morning. And he said, no, it's serious. He, he wants this to be his first movie. And I knew very little about films. I had been in the BBC making documentaries, but some people have areas of their life which they bypass, and mine were films and theater. But I did know two things about movies. That, that, is that one, they never get made. <laughs> and B, um, the screenwriter has to be paid. And so I said, well, could I write the screenplay? And he said, well, I'll come back to you tomorrow. I'll ask him. Following day, again at two in the morning, for some reason, these New York agents like disturbed in your sleep, he said, yes, Malkovich will let you do the screenplay. So then I was in a pickle because I hadn't watched many films. I read Sid Field on the art of screenwriting. I well, you had read it already, or at this no, point you rushed I, out I, and I, bought I, the I how to go. I spent lonely afternoons in the back of Nottingham Gate cinemas with my love affair was over and looking at JFK and things. And then I went to see the only person I knew who'd made a film, which was Richard Curtis, who was an old friend, and he had done three weddings and a funeral, or four weddings and a funeral. And he gave me the screenplay for four weddings and a funeral, which wasn't very helpful for a Peruvian terrorist um, <laughs> film. And he gave me two bits of advice. He says, never make a scene longer than three pages. And remember that every line you write is being watched on set by a hundred technicians who have far better things to do than to listen to your line. So make sure it's good. And I then holed up in the north of England in a house and wrote a, a screenplay according to Malkovich. He'd, he'd made a list of the scenes that he wanted from the novel. So I wrote a screenplay based on these scenes and then I prepared to fly out to Chicago to see him with this, with this kind of first draft. And I remember having meeting a wonderful writer, a Canadian writer called Mordecai Richler, who wrote many screenplays. I think The Room at the Top had won an Oscar. And he had lunch with me, and he, and he had credited his fame as a screenwriter for the stage directions, for making Lawrence Harvey have squeaking shoes as he walks across the carpet. Anyway, he said to me, are they flying you first class? I said, no. He said, are they meeting you in a limo? And I said, no. He said, ah, it's not going to happen. And I thought, as long as I'm flying first class, I know it's not going to happen. Oh, um, economy class, I know it's not going to happen. So I landed in Los Angeles, um, in Chicago, and I spent a week with Malkovich reading aloud what we had done. And what was rather good is that he had been in Peru in the very cafe that I had written some of the novel about, and he had clear notions about what he wanted to do with the novel. And he, the novel has a, a, a narrator like um, a journalist who is the, the waiter to the story. And he said, no, we don't need in the adaptation the narrator. The camera is the narrator. So I was quite, uh, I, mean, I think when you enter this world of, of, of Hollywood or, or filmmaking, you have to it's so constructed that you have to take leave of your senses when you enter it, and you have to just accept that it's not your thing. And I think at the end of the whole process, Markovich thought he'd written the novel. I mean, I think <laughs> it, it, it's such a kind of possessing, all-consuming enterprise. Anyway, the next six months, we um, battled back and forth, writing and rewriting, incorporating jokes that came up in conversation, and it was an incredibly pleasant experience writing the screenplay. I mean, because he believed that the script is all. It, once you've got the screenplay right, the film follows, as it did with your case, very quickly. And there were no other people creatively interfering in the process. It was you and him in a room together deciding the direction it was going to take. Either in his house in France, or in Los Angeles, where he lived, or in Chicago. It was just me and him. The problems came when you had finances. 
Um, I think they wanted to cast Cameron Diaz. They thought because they got Malkovich on board, he would bring all his friends from the Con Air set or something. And he said, no, no, I, this is a Peruvian film. I want European actors. And it took a long time to make because I think he was ab adamant that this was going to be the first film he ever directed. He wanted, it, he wanted to be in control of how it looked. And he got Javier Bardem, who was marvelous in it, and long before Javier Bardem was kind of very well known. And he stuck to his guns. And his agent complained that, I wish he hadn't made this film because all the business I've had to turn down while he's been trying to develop it, uh, he's turned down $15 million worth of business for this art movie set in Peru. And in terms of script, um, when we're, I mean, it sounds like you've both worked on your first project with people you really respect, uh, which isn't a common experience that writers have working in the film industry. Um, would I be right in thinking that on both of these projects, the second draft was better than the first draft, the third draft was better than the second draft, and so on? As you were being dragged through the process, you were being dragged in a direction that you wanted to go in, and you were, the script was improving. Do, do we think that's true? I mean, is, is that how these projects develop? And then, in particular, as you've gone on to write other films, has the development process been more painful? Because I know that <laughs> writers almost always call development, it's almost always called development hell. Um, and there must be a reason for that. It sounds like these were two very happy experiences of development. Um, what is the unhappy version <laughs> of that story? Um, there's a lot of unhappiness in screenwriting. If you want to be a screenwriter, you should really think deep and hard about it. I think somebody said about acting once that if you can think of doing something else, do it. And I think that's somewhat true of screenwriting as well. Um, I sometimes think of screenwriting as being a professional manic depressive. The highs are very high and the lows are very, very low. Um, and it's you know what William was talking about, this whole thing of development. You know, So you have creative freedom and you're writing this thing and it comes from your life and you love it and you love these people and you craft it with love. It's like being pregnant with a child and then you give birth to this child and everybody takes your child away from you. Um, and that's also because in screenwriting, unlike other forms of writing, you actually sell your copyright. The screenwriter doesn't own the copyright in the film as they do in art theater or in novels. Um, and then it goes to this process where all these other people are involved in how the movie turns out. Now, they come from different incentives. You know, as a writer, you want to tell this particular story. A director might want to tell a particular story, but the people who bring in money have other things that drive their concerns, and it's frequently catering to the lowest common denominator and how many viewers and how many seats you can fill in an audience, which often means that the process, the movie gets dumbed down. And the more expensive the movie, the more you have to cater to a wider swath. So. Um, Development can be a very, very difficult thing. Also, you're dealing with, and I hope I'm not offending any producers in the audience, because a good producer is a wonderful and valuable thing to have, but a lot of producers aren't creative people. So their inputs can be destructive because they don't necessarily understand the creative process, and yet they have enough power and leverage to have some say in it. Uh, like, for example, I remember I was, um, I was working on a script and I handed it in to the producer, and the producer came back and said something like, um, and this is almost a cliche because it's, it turns out it's happened to a lot of people. Like, you know, the script needs to be about 40, 45% funnier. It's like, <laughs> how do you execute that? How do you make something 40 to 45% funnier? Um, or, you know, and that's in some ways the least destructive part of the process. You know, stars can be. Um, you know, that's a double-edged sword as well. I mean, they can help finance a film, but they are also deeply invested in how they come across and what the character does and how many lines they have. So, yeah, development can make you very, very, very bitter, very, very, very unhappy. Whenever I'm stuck in that, I'm always fantasizing about something else I should have done with my life. I should go to, I should go to a small town in India and have a school for girls and educate them because that is <laughs> meaningful. And I should do something better with my life than this. Because yeah, I find so, one of the skills, writing prose, I mean, because you're also a writer of prose, I find when you write prose, the only thing you need to be able to do is write. Yeah. But I always think one of the most important skills you need as a screenwriter is to persuade. Mm. You need to know how to go into the meeting, and when some guy comes up with some terrible idea, you need to be able how to talk him round from the bad idea yeah. to the good idea, while making him think that it's still the idea that he suggested in the first yeah. place. 
Um, because there's a lot of ego involved in all of this. I mean, is that something... He'll want his name on the script as well. Uh, Yeah, exactly. But I mean, is that something you found, that the art of persuasion in development meetings is very important? Yes, I think I was lucky in that Malkovich was great protecting me from the financiers. I mean, we had a a moment at which the film was about to be made, and I was so thrilled, because as, as a screenwriter, you get the money on the first day of photography. And so it was going to go into production the following day in Madrid. And I'm in a Welsh farmhouse, and I suddenly get a call to ring him in Madrid. And I have a a coin box in the village, and I have seven pounds. And I ring him in Madrid, thinking that he's about to tell me it's all going. He said, I'm pulling out. Um, I'm sleezed out, he said. And I said, why? Uh, He said, these people, they've just sent a line producer to Madrid and the line producer has said that the novel is set in, a, in South America, a kind of Latin American fictitious, uh, but in Latin America they by and large speak Spanish. Anyway, the line producer had said, what are you going to do about all the street signs in Madrid? You know, they're in Spanish. So Markovic <laughs> had used this as the excuse to pull out. So I said, oh, and I, I'm feeding in the last kind of pound, and it goes, and I don't know how... <laughs> And then I read about two weeks later that he's about to do five films in development, none of them my film. And so two years go by in which I hear nothing. And then I get another call and he says, we're in production tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and I don't still quite believe it until it's, it's going to happen. Yeah. And then when it happens, I think the, the, the difficulty of being a, a novelist is that you haven't got the same expectations as you have for a film. I mean, any film, even an art house film, like The Dancer Upstairs, is going to be seen by millions of, or hundreds of thousands of people, and just as well not to have those expectations for a novel. And I, I remember a scene in a Porto in Peru where one of the, the main sequences is that there's lots of dead dogs strung from lamp posts. In, in, in the novel, and so he'd got some rather fat Dalmatians sent up from the Lisbon Pound, and they were being strung up from the lampposts in the central street of Oporto, which is a major European city of about you know, a million, two million people. And then we tanks went through the centre of town, and troops and helicopters, and all this was, was of something I had written. And then suddenly they blacked out the entire city, because to, to, to simulate a blackout in Lima. And I was thinking there's something crazy about filmmakers, that they can actually stop hospitals working and traffic lights just to bring into being um, a a kind of piece of celluloid uh, imagination. And in terms of you work and work and work on the script, but then at the end of the day, even when you've been through all the drafts and it's finished, it's still just a template for something else. What's the experience like of finally seeing the finished film? Did you both find that it correlates to what you had in mind in the script, or is it something surprising and different? Well, I think the difference between a novel and the adaptation of a novel is the difference between a donkey and a carrot. And I I think the difference between the screenplay and the film is also quite different, because you're just a vehicle for actors to bring in their own talents, for the director, the editor, the, the, the music, and we had Nina Simone doing the soundtrack. I mean, all of these people bring in just as much uh, talent and quality and, 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 and burnishment as the screenwriter. So you're looking at a foreign object in, in some ways. I mean, I remember the final um, frustration was that I saw it. He sent me a wonderful, the finished version. I thought, oh God, it's about to now be released. And we've gone through all the, the heartache that you will have suffered. And, and then suddenly, the British Board of Film Censors refused to give it a release because in the, in the film there's a scene where a chicken has exploded. It comes into a telephone exchange with a dynamite attached to its leg and then explodes, which is what The Shining Path often did with animals. Anyway, the British Board of Film Censors refuses to distribute the film because they think the chicken looks distressed. <laughs> and the film will not be released until the Ecuadorian farmer provides a certificate that the chicken came home happily that night. (laughs) And I thought that summed up in a way the whole craziness of the journey I had been on since that two o'clock in the morning telephone call. But equally, chickens aside, (laughs) presumably when you're writing a screenplay, you're sort of playing through the film in your head. You've got to think visually, you've got to think in terms of pacing. 
So that document correlates to a film that doesn't exist. And then there's a film that does exist. How closely do those match? Well, I, I mean, when I see Javier Bardem speaking lines that I wrote, and Nina Simone singing a song over it, I mean, I'm just in, in a kind of ludicrous heaven. That, that I, I think this happened because of something I wrote in a, in a study in a farmhouse in Wales. I, I think you're just so excited by what could happen if that happens the whole time. But as you and I know, this is a fantastic piece of luck. When a, when a script is made, it's not usually the case. It's not, and um, the, 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 the films that I worked on, the script, more or less was pretty much the movie. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't entirely Donkey and Carrot. Um, but even with that, I found, and I think this might be true of most writers, is that when I first see the movie that I've written or co-written, is all I can see uh, are, is everything that went wrong with it like where it didn't work. And it takes me a long time to appreciate what does work about that, because I think we often tend to be hypercritical about our own work. Um, and it can be really small, tiny things as well. Um, but frequently, with a lot of big budget films, with you know, certainly with films that are made by the big studios in, in Hollywood, the, strip, the, the movie that you see in screen may have absolutely nothing to do with what it is that you wrote which is very demoralizing, which is why screenwriters tend to be a very unhappy, bitter, angry lot. <laughs> and you've written um, American films, you've also written for Bollywood. Is that a completely different experience? Um, yes and no. Um, I've, I, the, the, I've done some work in Bollywood, mostly with one particular director, with Vishal Bharadwaj, and he is very story driven and he's wonderful to work with and he has great story instincts. Um, so it, creatively, it was a similar process. I mean, what is, it is different, of course. Um, there are different, you work in a different paradigm. I don't like that word, but whenever I'm lost for a word, I slip it in. Um, it's a different sort of context. I mean, for one, they're structured differently because they work on the interval point. You know, American films don't have the concept of the interval point. And that, in some ways, actually changes how you look at a movie structurally because there's the first half and then there's the second half, and sometimes the first and the second half can be, as you've probably seen, totally different, you know, sort of almost like two different kinds of movies. Can you explain Interval Point to someone who doesn't know Bollywood, such as myself? <laughs> so, Bollywood movies tend to be, on average, longer than an American film or a British film. Um, and they have an interval, which was usually the time that, you know, they'd, they'd stop the movie in the middle and people would go get refreshments or go use the restroom and then come back. It was five or ten minutes. It's not a concept that exists in American films. And it also doesn't exist in the same rampant way in Indian films anymore because they have multiplexes and they need to go from one screening immediately to the next. But those were single screen movies. And so you'd have this 10 minute break and you'd figure it out. And the men would go smoke, the women would go get popcorn, and then you'd sit back and you'd watch the movie all over again. But it also meant that you had to think in the writing about where you would actually cut the movie. It's a little bit like television, where you always have the cliffhanger right before the commercial break because you want people to come back to it. So it was important you cut the movie and that what happened just before you cut to the interval was pivotal in the storytelling because you wanted to make sure that people came back to see it. You don't think in the same way when you write an American film. Unless you're writing for TV, then you write to commercial breaks. Um, so they were different also because they were longer. They could sometimes have a prologue that was very long. Like I remember with Trishul, you know, there's Sanjeev Kumar and he falls in love with Vahida Rahman and then they're in love and then his mother doesn't approve and, but she's pregnant and then he gets married to someone else and then she leaves him and then she has a child and then the credits start. So it's like a whole little movie before the movie starts and it's also because our storytelling style in India is different. They're, you know, they derived from the epics. The early movies were mythologicals and you know, epics tend to be long, like the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. They have so many stories and so many subplots, and they're all... And our storytelling had the same sort of rhythmic sensibility, which in America doesn't exist in the same way. Does that answer it? So in terms of interval, 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 interval point, that reminds me of something that you come across in America all the time as a screenwriter, that producers seem to be obsessed with the three-act structure. Mm -hmm. Now, is that something that you've come, come up against and struggled with, this idea? Well, I suppose the three-act structure means two interval points. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you've been under pressure with your screenwriting to, to talk and think in those terms? Yes, I'm developing a, 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 four, a series of four 
um, dramas at the moment for ITV on Churchill coming to power in 1940. And they insist that you have to have this commercial break. So it's a, a three-part... Um, so you have to structure it in that way. It actually, mm. It's like a sonnet form. It actually helps you, in some ways, yes. to, to structure the material. Um, but what about in movies where those... I mean, I the, the commercial that. breaks are a reality. They happen. Mm. But in movies... This talk about three act structures and stuff—it's optional, and I think, um, I think it's often very much over overplayed. I don't think when I was writing the *Dance Upstairs* the, the movie script, I wasn't conscious of the five or three act structure. But I'm sure if you examine it, it's probably it's probably abiding mm -hmm. by certain architectural rules. But I think mm -hmm. all all works of art do in the end. I mean, a, an orchestral suite or a, a, yeah. a novel—you you see that the the architecture is quite similar. Um, yes, I know, it's funny, I think that as a writer, you have a kind of instinctual mm. feel for pacing and structure, for where it needs to speed up, where it needs to slow down, where you need crisis and resolution, further crisis. Mm. But then there's this whole, partly the industry of how to write screenplays, but also the way producers, it's their job to train, it's their job to make writers to write mm. a next draft and a next draft, and they need to know how to look at a script how to think, how to improve it. So they really need these things as props, don't they, to tell you what to do next. And I've struggled with that obsession. I mean, I'll give you an example. I had a moment where I was briefly in a position to kind of pitch things in Hollywood. They say, we want a movie about an American. We've brought the rights to a story about an American who buys a second division Italian football team and then they win the league. Pitch it to us. And you get this phone call and you think, oh, I could ignore this. And then you think, actually, I'll spend all afternoon wondering out whether or not I should do it. And actually, I could just spend a couple of hours writing this and then I can have the phone call and it will be completely pointless, but it might be a laugh. Why not go for it? And I remember writing something, it was that kind of story, and I just spent the afternoon think, cooking up an idea. I sort of knew it wouldn't happen, but I started by saying oh, I've divided it into sort of five, five acts to make it simpler. And the guy said, oh, five acts doesn't work. Five acts never works, it's got to be three. And I thought, there was a guy called Shakespeare, not this Shakespeare, the other Shakespeare. He used five-act structure, that worked. But from that moment on, I knew the whole idea was dead. He was a three-act structure guy, and that was that. And I found there's this kind of craziness of those things as, as props. Have you wrestled with that? Um, I, I, I haven't usually had producers tell me, give me three acts. You know, because when you write a script or when you watch a movie, it isn't broken into three acts you know, sort of a way to narratively structure the film. I think the, in my experience I found is if you can tell the story orally and it works, no one cares whether it's three or five or seven acts. Except it's, producers, they care, if it works. It if, works. It, if it works, they, they don't really care. I mean, and, you know, producers aren't a homogenous group. I have met probably different producers from the ones you've met. but. They, if it works, it works. So when it doesn't work, they sort of look for screenplay language to come into the game a little bit to understand is this, you know, it's the second act, which is, a, you know, and it's really a fancy way of saying beginning, middle, and end. You know, is the middle underdeveloped because it should be, you know, at least twice as long as the first act, you know, in a conventional uh, American style movie which is also true for most Bombay movies now, if the movie is about you know, 90 to 120 pages, one page is usually about a minute to a minute and a half on screen. The first act, which is the setup of the movie, is about 30 pages, the middle is about 60, and the rest of it is about the third act of the climax is about 10 to 15. This is very rule of thumb, it's not a science. I mean, these things move along, but generally you get a sense that, well, the middle of the movie must at least be twice as long as the setup. So when it doesn't work, they sort of bring in that language about how the second act feels underdeveloped, the climax is unsatisfying, mm -hmm. or what the second act crisis is, which are also frequently terms derived from theater. Yeah, you know, the five-act yeah. structure is really the three-act structure with two other points put in with the midpoint crisis and another you know, turning point in the first act. Yeah. So it is essentially the same thing. I found that when it works, it works. And when it doesn't work, people start stampeding. I mean, I don't know if you found this, William, because you're a celebrated novelist and screenwriter, but in my one experience of doing this, I felt such um, respect for, sc for screenwriters when I finished the process. Because, you know, although the, 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 it's only 60 pages or whatever, the screenplay, I mean, you've had to write the novel to get this skeleton. I mean, it's no... It came to no surprise to discover that Graham Greene, when he does, you know, probably our greatest film, The Third Man, he'd more or less written a short novel 
before writing the screenplay in order to find out the characters. You, you can't just go in with not knowing who the characters are or their backgrounds. And even if you're in a novel, you can probably use the backgrounds. But when you come to the screenplay, you're shaving that off. But you've got to know them. But there's people, no shortcut, I think, to a good yeah. screenplay. I, I, I think it takes just as long. It's like a children's story. I mean, my wife writes children's books, and they may only be 20 pages, but just as much work goes into shaving those 20 pages down as in a novel. But I think in fiction and books, nobody in the publishing world hangs on, believes that there is a structure no. that books should follow. Um, and that if they don't fit that structure, they won't work. They accept that when you write a novel, an interesting novelist might may invent a new structure, invent their own structure. You're never going to deliver a novel and your editor say to you, well, you've got a lull in the middle of the second act. Where's your, where's your third act? They're not gonna, they might be saying similar things, but they won't use that language. And I think there's a kind of pseudo-scientific language for talking about screenwriters in order to make producers feel like they're sort of like architects or engineers, like they have this language of a that makes their work seem more serious. There's a funny anecdote about this of, um, that I heard about somebody who was writing a kid's film. Just this, to show that the pervasiveness of this language. A guy in LA had written a kid's film, but he didn't have any kids. And so he showed it to his friend, also in Los Angeles, who had a sort of 10-year-old son, and said, can you get your son to read this and tell me what he thinks? I want to know what, kids, what a kid makes of this film. And he showed the script to the 10-year-old, and then he sat there to the 10-year-old and said, so what do you think of my kid's film? And the kid said, well, you've got a lull in the middle of the second act and your third act crisis is coming in too early. Because this is Los Angeles, they've all, all learned that language. So I'm interested in taking you back to what you said, how when you weren't sure how to write your first screenplay and you got the Sid Field book with this sort of how-to guide, was that stuff actually helpful? Did he tell you anything that you needed to know? No, because I think, I mean, it's all about pace and narrative. And if you're a novelist, that's what your speciality is. And so you have to quicken the pace and the narrative in, in, in the screenplay. Um, and I, I think Sid Field, I'm not sure who would benefit from Sid Field um, enormously. I mean, he's, he's telling Sid you common Field. sense, yes. I mean, it's meant to be the classic um, text in How to Write a, I'm sure he's made a lot of money from wannabe screenwriters, but I'm not sure if necessarily mm. some of the great screenwriters would have benefited from his advice, because it seems to be quite common sensical. Well, it's a huge industry. There are possibly more people make, making a living telling people how to write screenplays than there are people making a living writing screenplays. Well, there are creative writing courses all over the world, too. Mm -hmm. telling people I wonder what novels. you think. Do you teach screenwriters? I do. I teach and at uh, the, the Tisch School of the Arts, yeah. And, and do you feel like you're imparting useful knowledge? Uh, well, I hope I am. Um, so what, what two bits of advice, when Richard Curtis gives me two bits of advice, <laughs> what two bits of advice would you give? An aspiring screenwriter. To an aspiring screenwriter, um, well, those are two different questions. Whether I think the books are helpful and the two bits of advice, I'll come to that. Um, I, I found in my own writing that that the best way to learn to write is to actually write, um, and is to read a lot of screenplays because that can be immensely helpful to see how it works on the page. Because it's one thing to understand how it works theoretically or on the screen, but it works on the page in a different way because you don't have actors, you don't have background score, you don't have beautiful sets, you have none of those other elements that make a movie very watchable. Uh, so reading screenplays, especially screenplays of movies you like, and actually even more so screenplays of movies you don't like. Uh, because when a movie doesn't work, it's easier to tell whether writing failed than when a movie that does work because so many elements go into that. Um, I have found some books helpful, not said field, but I've actually found that books on theater have been extremely helpful for writing for the screen. Um, and because they're both dramatic mediums, there is a certain commonality with both of them. In terms of what advice I would give to aspiring screenwriters, there's just a wealth to choose from. Um, one is, um, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> so many come to mind. So um, <clears throat> you only have control till you take any money. So while you have that control, exercise it to the best of your ability. Think of producers, you know, as those kind of like horrible men. If you're female and if you're not, imagine you are you know, who seduce you and seduce you and seduce you and then once you sleep with them, they want to have nothing to do with you. So producers are a little bit like that. 
they are very seductive and they're very charming and they're lovely and they're wonderful and you feel so important and valued and then once you take some money that's done so uh, so hold on to that but that's commercial advice artistically uh, this is something I wish I had come up with but somebody else wrote this and I and I think it's uh, and I and I've uh, always held this close to my heart is don't be afraid whether or not something is commercially viable, whether it fits into the elements of what's successful right now and what works right now, and if it has this in it and if it has that in it. Write without fear or favor. Write truthfully, because eventually good movies become universal. The more specific you are, the more universal you become. And each of us has a distinct story to tell because nobody in the world has had exactly the same experiences that you've had. So in that way, what you're writing and what you bring to it is very original. Don't lose that originality writing about something else in some other world that somebody else will relate to. Uh, be truthful because, you know, that's also the only reason to write in some ways. I mean, if you're writing a screenplay, which I find you know, I teach and I meet writers and people think of films as a very lucrative medium and they want to write a screenplay because, you know, Matt Damon got a million dollars for his first screenplay, whatever what that god-awful movie was, Goodwill Hunting. Um, and so you think, well, uh, you know, so that I, I haven't done research on this, but I can, I'm pretty sure if I did, it would bear out, is that you statistically have better luck buying lottery tickets than thinking you'll write a screenplay that will sell for a million dollars. So what I mean by that is that the incentive to write that should be much purer, should come from the desire to tell a story, to write about the world, to explore human nature or reflect on the world in some sort of way, whether it's to engage the world or comedy or tragedy, it doesn't matter what it is, but it should come from that. That instinct will be diluted by the world and will be compromised by the world. As you go on, there's no question about it, but at least start from that place because otherwise, What's the point of doing it? What do you think? One of the things I envy you as a screenwriter <laughs> is when you write the novel, and William, you will agree with this, you have to do the silences, you have to do the music, you have to do all the things that in the screenplay the actors do. And you, you, in a sense, the more you cut in the screenplay, the better it is. So you have to learn the less dialogue there is. Mm -hmm. Whereas in a novel, you're you're expanding dialogue sometimes, mm. and you're having descriptive passages to create that silence. And it, that can take as, as much time to describe a silence as, as a whole dialogue. And I think well, some of the great moments in film, are when the act, I mean, in Dance Shop Stairs, at, at the end, Javier Bardem is just looking, the, the camera's just on his face, and he's just listening, he's just watching a girl dance. And I can't do that in the novel. So, mm. The screen. And did you know when you were writing that scene how powerful it was going to be? Was that something that just happened on set? No, I knew it was going to be powerful because his face is so extraordinary and holds the camera. I mean, he's a beast with the camera. The camera just wants to follow him everywhere. And Malkovich had always got this Nina Simone song which had not been heard before. It had been once recorded on a record that had not done very well. And it was Who Knows Where the Time Goes, sung by Nina Simone in a bar. And it was the most amazing rendition of this song. And this was always going to be the kind of soundtrack. And so we, we, we were looking to put Bardem's face watching his daughter dance with this soundtrack. Now, there's no music in a novel. You, you can't, I can't suddenly convey music through my prose. Um, Nina Simone singing. I can, have a, I can have the words, but it doesn't mean anything. And so I think you're, the very exciting thing in screenplays is you're dealing with other media that a novelist is not, is forbidden from. Except, except, what's exciting about a novel is that a novel does things that a film can't do. Mm -hmm. And I think the danger for novelists who try and write filmic novels is that they end up not being very good novels. Hmm. Because if the novel can't do something that only the novel can do, um, it shouldn't be doing it. I mean, it's interesting, I want to go back further on that Javier Bardem moment you talk about, because I think this is something that's very interesting in screenwriting. When you have your moment, in prose, and you think this is the emotional moment I've been building towards, you can sort of pace that to yourself. Mm -hmm. But um, when you're writing it in a screenplay, if the key moment is a moment of silence, mm -hmm. of a guy just watching somebody dance, how you actually put that on a page in screenwriting is difficult. Because I don't know if the audience have read screenplays, the 
prose of screenplays is very sparse and very bare. You can't wax lyrical and say he looks at his daughter mm. and he feels all these wonderful things. It's totally forbidden. To, you can't say the character is feeling X or Y or Z as you can in prose because how are the audience going to know that? And you've got to write it in a very spare way. So how you put those big emotions, so, sort of non-dialogue based emotions into a screenplay in such a way that the people who are reading the screenplay will know that's an important scene, that's very difficult. How do you, how do you go about doing that? Well, you mentioned the word collaboration. I think if you've got a very strong relationship with the director, producer, he knows how he's going to be, or she knows how they're going to be using the words in the scene, and you've discussed it um, with them. And so, I, mean, I remember having heard Mordecai Richler's thing about the squeaking shoes for Lawrence Harvey and how all the action is in the stage directions. I remember thinking, oh, I must pay particular attention to the, to the stage directions. And then we got to one moment I was flown, I knew the film was going to happen when suddenly I was given a first class ticket to fly as Malkovich's nanny to fly to Nevada where he was shooting Con Air. And um, I got to the set where things were blowing up all over the place. And um, I remember seeing Ving Rhames, like all the movies I'd been watching in order to write the screenplay, I'd seen Pulp Fiction, which I thought was fantastic, and I suddenly saw Ving Rhames walking across to the canteen. I said, God, you do that amazing dialogue in Pulp Fiction. And he said, yeah, it wasn't in the script, I made it up. And I said, remind me, remind me what it was. And he said, I can't remember. <laughs> and I thought, here's a man who might have given me some tips in dialogue for, for the screenplay I was working on, and he couldn't. You know, I, um, for me, I think it's, it's different. I mean, in, you know, screenwriting is all about finding ways to dramatize the internal mind, uh, you know, and I think it comes in even before the process of collaboration. It is on the page. You're always thinking, you know, in a, in a novel, you know, it's like you can tell what people are doing and what they're thinking about while they're picking up a glass of water. In a film, you only have image and sound, so all you see is somebody picking up a glass of water, but you have to constantly force yourself to find ways to externalize, to dramatize, mm. to find ways that you show what people are doing because you can't just tell the audience what people are doing. I mean, you could have a movie that's, you know, two and a half hours of dialogue, but that would be very boring. Uh, of a voiceover. Um, and in some ways, I think that's the fundamental difference between novel writing and screenplay writing, because in screenplay writing, it's all external. It's all what people are doing mm. and people are saying. That's all you have. Background score, you mentioned it. Background score can be as important as dialogue in a movie, because it really can inform your experience of a film. So there are all these various elements, and as a screenwriter, you have to always be cognizant of those. Um, to me, a lot of my writing isn't about dialogue. It's actually about what people are doing in that scene, and you know, and who they are, and how I go from one scene to the next scene, and what the transitions are, you know, between one scene and the next. Um, so, uh, but that's that's you know, that's 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 where the engineering comes yeah. in. That in that way, it is like being an engineer. You have to understand the craft of how to build a table. Now, you might think a table needs four legs and you want to build it with you know, half a leg, and that's possible, but you have to understand the physics of how a table stands. Yeah. And screenwriting is like that. There is a lot of craft in it. Yeah, I think, that's, I think you put your finger on a very interesting thing about screenwriting. I think in the sense that like all good art, all good drama, is at heart about emotion. And in a novel, you put in the emotion. In a screenplay, you can't put in what people are feeling. You can only dramatize. And there are a number of screenwriting tricks for doing it. And it's funny, if you're a screenwriter, you spot them a lot. If 10 minutes into a film, somebody says, Daddy, I want you to have this little carved wooden thing I've made for you. Isn't it great? And he goes, yes, son, it's great. You know that kid's for the chop. You know they're going to be yeah. separated so that 90, an hour later, the guy can reach into his pocket and look at this object. And that's a sort of technical screenwriter saying, I've invested my love for my son in this piece of wood. So that then when he's not there, I can take out this thing and I've made it visual. I've made that emotion yeah. visual. And there are those, and they're sort of tricks, actually. And you oh, can't use tricks like yeah. that in fiction because it's too cheap, but you actually have to in screen. No, writing. film is very manipulative. I mean, you know, it, you know, people talk about, well, that film was so manipulative, and you know, another film isn't. They're all manipulative. It's just who hides the manipulation better. 
uh, but there's a lot of manipulation. I mean, it's, that's a great example. Whenever you know two people, especially a parent and a child are really happy, or a couple is really happy, you know terrible things are going to happen to them because it yeah. wouldn't be a movie worth watching. I mean, that's the only way you're investing us in that relationship. Yeah. Or, you know, the, 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 the man and the woman can't stand each other. You know they're going to end up falling in love. They have to. There's no other reason to have them hate each other. And the um, other one that I like is the way in films nothing is irrelevant. I've become obsessed with that. In films, it's a game I play with my wife when we're watching movies at home. If any character coughs, they've got between five or ten minutes to live. You know, it's going to turn it because time is so telescoped. In fact, it's literally it's a game we play. It's a happy scene. It's something. Like, <coughs> I think, what is it? No, no, it's nothing. It's nothing. Get done. And we'll have a little sweep. They say, I give her seven minutes. Now I give her ten. And they're always dead because you've got to. You've got to. If something terrible like tuberculosis is going to happen. You've got to sow the seed. Before it happens, they can't die straight away, but they don't, you don't have very long to sow the seed in effect. I feel like you're denigrating screenwriters here, William, in an <laughs> But there's a skill well, to Well, yeah, it. it's just nothing. You have ten things, you do those ten things, and you've got a successful movie. There's really nothing to it. But what's happening no. in, 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 what's your opinion on, on series? Because you don't have to have, you can have more irrelevant stuff if you know it's going to be a series of 30. I mean, what, what's exciting at the moment as is, is how much good writing is going on in these television series like Borgen and the French series Spiral or The Wire. Mm. Um, and I think part of the excitement as a, as a novelist watching this is you've got the density of the novel in some of these screenplays, yeah. in the knowledge that you don't have to abide by the cliches or the, the, the gimmicks, that this is all going to be over in two and a half hours and everybody's got to remember everything in the... No, I think, I think you're dead right. I think those shows, those big HBO mm -hmm. shows, I think they've raised the bar yes. in terms of film. And I think in terms of fiction, I've read interviews with a couple few novelists saying, what was your biggest influence? And they'll say, oh, it was oh, The Wire or The Sopranos. Wire. I think it's raised the bar for everyone and slightly mm -hmm. terrified yes. everyone. Because how, how does anyone go about trying to write something as good as The Wire? Well, well, presumably you, it's collaboration. I mean, presumably it's two or three screenwriters who are able to, to, to spark off. Well, it's also because, uh, you know, in America right now, all the great writing really is being done in TV and not so much in film. In India, it's kind of the opposite. There's much more experimentation in cinema right now, and our television is mediocre and underutilized, by and large. Um, for one, I think it is that writers getting better with the screenplay system, move to TV, what TV allowed. So here's the thing, in a movie, the director becomes important because they shepherd the film from its inception all the way through post-production. In television, the writer is inconsequential, the director is inconsequential because you can have a different director each episode and it doesn't matter. But you need to have the same writer who has created those characters because they have to write the episode after and the episode after and the episode after which gives the writer much more importance. The so writers have much more importance on television. If you created, if you wrote an episode which was a pilot for a TV show, you are also usually the executive producer or the producer of the series. So the writer is, all, is often the producer as well in television, whether it's Mad Men or Sopranos or The mm -hmm. Wire. So the writer has much more leverage and therefore has much more creative control and authority of the material, unlike film. At least, you know, within America, that's, that's the case. So, uh, which is why America has been producing a lot of really good television um, lately. The other thing that I think helps with TV, which didn't exist, I mean, it's not like suddenly Americans woke up and wrote The Sopranos. I mean, there's mm. been television for decades before that. But when it was um, the networks, the networks, again, like film, had to cater to a very large audience because it was everybody at home watching it. The rise of cable television meant that you could actually target very specific demographics. HBO has a certain kind of demographic, so does Showtime, so does Lifetime, which meant you didn't have to dumb it down to the lowest common denominator. You could actually write to a specific audience, so be an adult audience of this age and this time, the kind of audience that would watch The Wire, which then allowed you to write more truthfully because you didn't have to pander in the same way. Yeah. Films have to pander because they have to more or less be family films or date films or something or the other so they have to appeal to a much wider base you know and everything is diluted when you do that so I think the lesson we can draw from that is the way to make everything better is to put writers in charge absolutely what better is their way to end a talk at a literary festival uh, more more power for writers uh, we've only got about five minutes left I'm afraid okay. but if there's any questions I'd love to open it up to the audience uh, yeah, a gentleman there in a gray hoodie 
Oh. One question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so oh, that's okay. Okay, gentleman in the grey hoodie. In the third row, I think. Hi. Oh, um, I have this question in my mind for quite some time now. Uh, what if a writer? What if a writer is fully convinced with something he has written? And uh, there's this line of producers who usually don't belong to the same school of thought and then ask you to add that 45% of comedy in it. And uh, so what, what should the writer do? Should he just jump off the cliff because he is going to be, he's going to, he's going to get a, his first release? Uh, or is there a, a, a a suitable and affordable compromise to it and does it even exist? That's a really good question. Um, in some ways being a screenwriter is also learning to be a negotiator and you're working with people who have just taken something hostage and you have to negotiate a release for it. So it is a collaboration so you have to pick your battles. There are some things I sometimes a, a, a producer will say you know you said yes on page 8 and then on page 56 he says yes again that's two yeses you know it just feels repetitive and you say well I'll change that to a uh huh and he'll be like yeah that's great and this actually happened to me so who cares it's such a small battle the actor will probably just shrug and get it away with so you pick your battles you let them get some things and I am probably offending a lot of you who are either producers or related to producers but you have to let them feel and and I don't mean to denigrate producers as well, because producers can give you very useful input that you don't think of. I mean, also as writers, sometimes we are precious and think our word is so sacred and so inviolable that you know, nobody should change it, and that also isn't helpful or productive or necessarily right. You have to learn which battles you pick. So you fight the ones you can fight, but the way to fight them is to not fight them with emotion, which is very, very hard for writers because writing is such a personal thing. It's so emotional that you always respond with emotion. And your first thought is this person is an idiot and they are going to ruin my writing. And of course you think that and you're right to think that. However, you have to train yourself to calm yourself down, to not get emotional, to not get angry because the moment you get angry, you surrender all power. So you have to keep power to yourself and find a way to rationally defend your point of view. So my rule of thumb, I, you know, I've learned to develop a thick skin about these things, but that doesn't mean I don't get riled up. So my rule of thumb is, I usually wait for 24 hours before I respond to a producer's note. Because the moment I get it, I'm just flying off in anger. And, and the other thing that's helpful is have people around you who are willing to hear you vent, because you will vent a lot. And it's nice to have people who will hear it and say, you know, you're so right. I mean, the, God, these people, they have no sense. And he said what? You need girlfriends. You all need to have girlfriends who will bring out ice cream and said, what? He did that? God, I know. It's so stupid. And you know what he did last time? Remember when I read about him on Twitter? So have that. You need a support system. Writing is solitary. You frequently feel like you're drowning, so you need that you know that world of people who will support you up and validate you also remember all writers are secretly afraid and I maybe this is not true of Nicholas and William but that they're just flukes waiting to be found out that they actually have no talent at all and they've somehow managed to wing this so far but in the next book everyone's going to find out they're really completely talentless idiots so we all live with that fear and so when a producer gives us notes in a way it's validating what we already think about ourselves which can always be a very sensitive thing. So deal with it rationally, let them get something. I mean also remember even a broken clock is right two times a day. So even if they really don't know what they're talking about they might have something to offer. So consider it, think about it, respond rationally and if they have completely destroyed your work the best revenge is doing good work and never working with them again. That's great. And the other alternative, like I was saying before, is you change their mind while trying to convince them that they've changed your mind, that it was their idea. I don't know about if you've found that. But should we move on? Should we try and make time for one more question? Have we got time for one more? Let's have one last question and we can turn to Nicholas. Yeah. Okay, question Hi. here. Hi. Could you talk about a time that you have used your leverage as a screenplay writer to change the storyline or alter it. Nicholas, do you want to have a go at that? Do you want to have a go at that? I, 
the one thing, I, I accept that once you take, you said that once you take money from these people, you have to do what they say. And so in answer to your question, what do you do if you're asked um, to, uh, to do something you don't want to do, I think you have, you have to do it because the screenwriter, as you will have all heard the story, is very low on the set. I mean, he or she is the person the Polish actress sleeps with by mistake thinking they're important. I think you would write a novel if you want to have complete control over your material. I remember talking, answering your question about how I tried to influence. The one thing I didn't want in the novel or the screenplay was for the two protagonists to sleep with each other. I felt that was the, the core of the drama. And I felt that if Hollywood made Malkovich make them sleep with each other, I would have to kind of walk off set. And I, so I begged him. And I think they did want him to sleep um, with each other. And I said, there'll, there'll be no drama, because the whole drama is that they don't get to sleep with each other. And he, he fought on my behalf for them not to sleep with each other. So I felt in preserving the original screenplay, I had actually fought against what they wanted. I think we've ended with a beautiful moment of chastity there. I think that's a lovely note to close on. So I'd like to thank Nicholas and Sabrina very much for a very interesting talk. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you for an extremely enlightening session on how to write a screenplay. I don't think any of us could have had a better uh, insight into the world of screenwriting. So we come to the end of another day at the Jaipur Literature